you know, Benghazi presents a paradox. There was four years of partisan warfare over this event. And yet with all the noise, and, and I argue because of the noise, we never really got down, got into the, to the details of who was behind this, what really unequivocally happened there? Where did it come from? As in, it didn't just come out of nowhere. There were antecedents, and I link those antecedents both to 9-11 and to the rapprochement with Gaddafi. An excerpt from today's guest has written a new history of the attack on Benghazi, now more than a decade ago. Middle East diplomat and author Ethan Chorin is here, and I'll speak with him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Gift-giving season is here, and for the military history lover on your list, check out my book about the Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you purchase the book or audiobook, which is available now in stores and online. Welcome back. And before we get into the show, remember to click the follow button on the podcast to be notified of future fantastic guests like the author we're speaking with today. And thank you. Today's guest is a former diplomat, senior political analyst, author, and environmental entrepreneur. From 2004 to 2006, he was one of a handful of U.S. diplomats posted to Libya to help set up a U.S. mission. He was in Benghazi on the night of the attack in 2012 and was nominated to succeed Christopher Stevens as the ambassador to Libya. His book is called Benghazi, A New History of the Fiasco That Pushed America and Its World to the Brink. And author Ethan Chorin joins us now. Ethan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure, sir. And you were involved with Libya early on uh, in trying to establish diplomatic relations with Gaddafi. What was that experience like? Well, it was extremely interesting and uh, at times a bit surreal. I was part of a small number of uh, diplomats sent to Tripoli um, after the 2003 agreement with Gaddafi. Uh, I was posted there from 2004 to 2006. It was a small small uh, group of people. We were working under rather strenuous circumstances in terms of time pressure and resources. And as I mentioned in the book, the, some of the, the circumstances were superficially and maybe a little more deeply very reminiscent of the setup in Benghazi in 2012. Did you have direct contact with Gaddafi? I never had uh, direct, well, let's see, I was uh, sent to listen to his speeches on many occasions. He had uh, this uh, tendency to want to call command performances of ambassadors and our charge at the time uh, was wise enough to uh, to send one of his more junior people, me, to uh, to go out and take uh, take notes and listen to these talks, which sometimes took literally two days in the process of getting to the talk in in uh, the marble palace of uh, or hall of Wagadugu in Sirte, and uh, getting to and from on um, ancient seven twenty sevens outfitted with Soviet engines. Wow. <laughs> heavy security, I, I imagine. Uh, security, I, I'm sure that there was heavy security on Gaddafi's part. Now, bringing it up to 2012, what brought you to uh, Benghazi to, uh, to be there on the eve of the attack? Well, I had, I had left the Foreign Service after about four and a half years and uh, went to, I, I was posted subsequently in the UAE and had a, 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 t a language and intensive language course in, in Washington and had joined a, a company in Dubai. And while when the revolution, the Libyan revolution broke out in 2011, I had a strong urge to go back to Libya. I think the, the connections that I made there were very strong. I, I had gotten to know literally thousands of people and heard their stories over the course of, 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 of two years and just felt that this was really a momentous occasion. And we hadn't expected that the that, that an event, uh, an upheaval of this kind would 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 happen so so quickly. I can't say that it was unexpected. I think we all speculated about this. Um, but certainly it was very dramatic. And I was getting calls from Libyan colleagues who were 
uh, asking me to intervene on their behalf, thinking I was still in the States in matters of, sort of immediate life and death. So I sort of got tugged back in there and a Libyan American colleague and I decided that we would try basically quit our jobs and try to go back and see if we could come up with start an NGO that was focused on ultimately medical infrastructure because we felt that that was the way we could best help uh, uh, the people and the institutions we knew. Uh, and in that context, we were in Benghazi on the on the on the date of the attack. Was it ever discovered who was ultimately responsible for the attack, and uh, were they? ever brought to justice? That's a very interesting question. I think that's that's one of the couple of the issues that I address in my book is that you know Benghazi presents a paradox. There was four years of partisan warfare over this event. And yet with all the noise, and and I argue because of the noise, we never really got down got into the to the details of who was behind this. What really unequivocally happened there? Where did it come from? As in, it didn't just come out of nowhere. There were antecedents, and I link those antecedents both to 9-11 and to the rapprochement with Qaddafi. Um, in terms of, of bringing people to justice, I argue that there's probably a link with uh, uh, Al-Qaeda Al leader, I mean, uh, uh, Zawahiri. Um, and of course, he was assassinated by the US uh, not, 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 not long ago. But this was absolutely a uh, an, an attack by an Al Qaeda affiliate. We, the U.S. intelligence agencies, understood at least some people in some of the some of the divisions that Al Qaeda was working through proxies in Libya, and the goal was to de destabilize the country and expand their presence. So there was a long tail. Of course, the whole thing has been obscured by this argument, partisan argument over who. Uh, the proximate causes of the attack, whether there was a protest before the attack that evolved into the attack itself, was it linked to the um, protest and attack against the U.S. Embassy in Cairo? I argue that it's actually quite much more complicated than that and, sim and more simple. Um, but as a witness, as somebody who was an oral witness to what was going on, I was on the, on, on the phone with various people, Libyan officials and uh, uh, with whom we were working, and the mission itself during the start of the attack and had a chance to inter to talk with witnesses, Western witnesses right after it, uh, diplomats and corporate uh, people. Uh, it was very clear to us that this was a, a an organized attack from right. almost, almost instantly. And, and it took me nine days to get back to back to the States as I I left on the last commercial flight out and had to wait for a colleague to join me. And when both of us got back to the States, the what we heard in the in the general media from from both sides was just baffling. And it, it in fact, it, it made me so upset. I, I just I didn't want to think uh, poorly of any uh, of 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 uh, uh, how do I how do I explain this? I, I just I just felt that this was a a almost I was living in another universe. Right. And I could and I couldn't talk because I felt as if if I started to say things in the media, uh, I was also on a book tour at the time for another book um, that I would get sucked into the maelstrom of this political uh, mess. And that's not something a position that I wanted to be in. At the same time, I wanted to tell my part of the story. And it literally took 10 years to be able to do that because the doors closed very quickly. People got very tired of all of the. The rancor and the and the, and the fighting, and I think the American public just felt there was no substantive, truthful source of informa of information that they could they, that they could turn to, and I don't I don't blame them. Um, but it, it's a remarkable event that also had a long uh, and rather profound impact on American foreign policy and domestic politics. And I think that is what we've lost sight of completely, particularly as we get engaged in all of this. Uh, you know the issues around uh, the events of uh, January 6th, etc. And in my book, I try to be very balanced in, in terms of saying that um, both sides, Democrats and Republicans, are actually complicit in this mess. Uh, and it's a it's a sort of a, a a cancer within the within the American political system that the that foreign policy, military policy, has become politicized right. uh, for domestic purposes. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next week is Thanksgiving week in the U.S., a huge time for college football, and we've got an incredible college football bowl story from World War II you're not going to believe. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Buzz Bissinger will be here to discuss 
the Mosquito Bowl. It had sort of this minor legendary stature, and some were shocked. I mean, there was supposed to be radio silence at sea because of, of the presence of the Japanese, and a radio man was listening to the game. And his captain said, what the hell are you listening to? He said, I think it's a football game on Guadalcanal. But he said, what? And he said, well, if, you know what? If the Marines are playing football on Guadalcanal, the war must be over. Another reason to click that follow button to be notified when the episode releases. And before we return to the conversation, if you're enjoying this story on Benghazi, check out our earlier program with former CIA counterterrorist chief of operations Rick Prado, the man first tasked to track down bin Laden. You cannot run operations through a, a political optic. Uh, operations should be led and devised and approved by the people that know what the hell they're doing. That doesn't mean you don't do it with White House approval, but you cannot allow a political you know, optic to change that. Bay of Pigs is a perfect example of that, and many, many others. It's show 175 from season three, and you'll easily find it in our past episodes. Was this, when you came back to the States, was this your first experience uh, realizing that they were trying to paint a narrative that didn't match reality? Well, yes, I, I felt that the this whole question of uh, of the vagueness around what happened there was, uh, and the persistent vagueness was was problematic. Uh, you know, there were these very famous statements by uh, uh, various members of the Obama administration, just very careful statements. And I felt that that was detrimental to not only the pursuit of, of what actually happened there uh, and clearing all of this stuff up quickly and responding to it, um, I, th I think that was the main. And as someone who, someone among among many on the ground, I felt that uh, there were resources available to to consult, and that those those had not been consulted. I also felt that that uh, as as time went on, that that certain individuals, particularly Ambassador Stevens, that their role in the whole affair had been somewhat perverted by the media and marginalized. When in fact, this, you know, Ambassador Stevens had a substantial role in getting the U.S. to and the Obama administration to yes on the intervention. And I think there was a I had various conversations with him before the attack uh, and there was a profound uh, 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 disappointment that or and or expectation that the United States would do more in Libya. This was echoed uh, actually by Hillary Clinton in my interviews with her when she said uh, for the book, in which she said that really she felt that there was a ton more we could have done in Libya, uh, and we, we we lost that opportunity. And ironically, Benghazi really was the trigger for our immediate abandonment of of not only Benghazi, which we intervened to save uh, ostensibly from Gaddafi's drubbing. Uh, and Libya itself, which went over uh, the, our, the fragile transition, went over a cliff. Are there any lessons that we, you know, in hindsight, that you believe we've moved forward with from the whole experience in Benghazi? Well, that's the concerning thing, and it's not uh, something that uh, only I have said. Uh, a number of former diplomats and, and political and military figures have said we are not learning the lessons each time we're attacked. We go back, we, we engage in this uh, self-beating uh, at home, and we don't uh, improve the processes. And one of my other big arguments in the book is that since 9-11, essentially every administration has has helped degrade the institutional capacity of the U.S. to analyze and act on threats, uh, and in different ways. Uh, the Bush administration essentially uh, used the 9-11 to twist some of the bureaucracies and pit them against one another in order to make a case for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and the Obama administration was essentially operating under a, 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 a sort of a siege mentality that the right was going to attack them at every corner, thus they couldn't be uh, seem to, they want to avoid more of this stuff. So the bureaucracies and particularly the NSC was aligned as a, as a kind of a bulwark against, against those attacks, but they were in the process severing the links with the experts on, you know, in, in every single division of government, whether it was the state department or the department of defense. Um, I think there, and that is the, the, uh, and of course with president Trump, i uh, it's been fairly clear that he felt the uh, State Department was uh, was marginal at best and showed many people the door. 
And as Secretary of State Blinken has correctly noted, um, but I think he was only referring to the Trump administration, not the entire period before this, the, uh, the cost of that damage is, is incalculable. Essentially, it'll take us ages to try to get back the people we've lost and to uh, to shore up our, our intelligence capacities that have been, and, and, and not to say that we don't have great people uh, uh, still in these right. bureaucracies. They're, they're essentially operating without the resources that they need to do their job. Now, you referenced this earlier. It's been 10 years since the incident, and, uh, and you waited for a while to bring this book out. Why bring it out now? Well, I tried. I actually started writing the book back in 2014, and uh, the book was rejected, I think, 48 times by publishers on the basis of uh, two, two, two factors that were at least told to me. One was that it's too controversial, and the second was that nobody cares about Benghazi. No one will buy a book about Benghazi. And it took a long time for, for I think, a certain amount of time to pass where uh, it became a revision, revisionist, not revisionist, but an, a new look at, 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 the, at, the, at the attack and the scandal after a long time has passed. So I still don't know whether there's an appetite in the United States for looking at this in any depth. There, there certainly is some sort of a layer of uh, aversion to the topic based on everything that's happened. But, you know, we've also, it's been the 10th anniversary of the attack a few days ago, and there was nothing in the media about Benghazi. There were these sort of ritualistic uh, uh, sympathies for the victims of the original attack, which were, of course, uh, is, is necessary, um, but there was we heard nothing of the of the victims of the Benghazi attack or, you know, it was simply, it's as if it, it, it hadn't happened. So I'm trying very hard to to bring this to the surface and say, look, we have a lot of lessons that we need to, to learn. And Benghazi is not just Benghazi, it is a window and a, uh, and a sort of a signal booster uh, into all of the, the factors that are per present in our current uh, existence, the polariz intense polarization, the, uh, the withdrawal and retreat from various of the Middle East uh, conflicts, um, and the consequential empowerment of our ad adversaries. Um, you know, there's a there was a there was a cartoon in the Onion, which I which I which I which oh. resonated greatly with me. I love the Onion, <laughs> yes, which showed two two jihadists sitting on a couch watching television, and above it was a caption that said, uh, "FBI announces it has discovered Al Qaeda plot to sit back, relax, and watch America destroy itself," which really is the I think the message of the of my book. Um, you know, we're 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 are, see, we are so consumed with uh, self hatred uh, or uh, competing hatreds in this country that we're allowing foreign policy to, to just be a, a springboard to our own disputes and are losing influence and, 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 and uh, uh, a capacity to understand what's going on and continuity across the board. And this is disastrous for the United States. And really, we can't continue to keep and uh, we can't continue to, to, to be a superpower and, rely, and, and exist in this kind of atmosphere. No, it's, it's not possible. I, I couldn't agree more. The book is called Benghazi, the new history of the fiasco that pushed America and its world to the brink. Ethan, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Next week is Thanksgiving week in the U.S., a huge time for college football, and we've got an incredible college football bowl story from World War II you're not going to believe. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Buzz Bissinger will be here to discuss the Mosquito Bowl. It had sort of this minor legendary stature, and some were shocked. I mean, there was supposed to be radio silence at sea because of, of the presence of the Japanese, and a radio man was listening to the game. And his captain said, what the hell are you listening to? He said, I think it's a football game on Guadalcanal. But he said, what? And he said, well, if, you know what? If the Marines are playing football on Guadalcanal, the war must be over. Another reason to click that follow button to be notified when the episode releases. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.